thank you all for joining us today for uh, Verda Alexander's uh, lecture for the Hyde um, as part of the College of Architecture's lecture series. So I am very honored to get to introduce um, Verda. She is one of the co-founders of Studio O Plus A, uh, the San Francisco design firm responsible for groundbreaking offices at Facebook, Microsoft, Slack, McDonald's, and many others. Verda Alexander has spent 30 years in the design industry, redefining workplace and looking ahead to the future of work itself. Her current work focuses on expanding the conversation around design, social justice, climate activism, and art. She is leading efforts at her firm and across the industry to put planet and people first in the design process. Her newest effort is Breaking Some Dishes, a podcast she co-hosts that engages innovators from industry and design in conversations about meeting the challenges of climate change. In 2016, Studio Oplace received the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Interior Design and was named by Contract Magazine Designer of the Year in 2012. So again, Verda, we are very pleased to have you with us today. Um, for those of you that have just started joining, uh, Verda is going to go through her question or her presentation. There'll be an opportunity for Q and A at the end, so you can use the um, function on Zoom at the bottom of the screen um, for that. So, with that, Verda, I will turn it over to you. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Kendra. <clears throat> very excited to be here virtually in Nebraska. <laughs> Uh, oh, I can't even ask the students anything. Oh, and you just went offline. I'd love to know how warm it is there. <laughs> um, is it 50 today? It's, un well, not unseasonably, but normally we would have the snow that everyone else is getting. So okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll take this a brush of spring. <clears throat> Climate change. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I can't see anybody. So I'm just basically talking to myself here for 45 minutes. I... Um, I told I told Kendra if there's a question that comes up that's relevant in the moment that, to feel free to interrupt me. So if you guys can do that or want to do that, please do. I want this to be would love for this to be informal, but here I am in a box uh, staring at myself <laughs> doing a talk. All right, now I, I've broken this talk into four parts: uh, past present and future and futures I've got um, looking at future of work and then future of our practice and <clears throat> I always like to start with a little bit of past so you can see the work that my firm has done over the last 30 years and I won't speak oh, I, oh here we go fast forward button oh my god okay my keyboard didn't work <laughs> my buttons on my keyboard didn't work but I there's a little arrow on my screen that's working. Okay, I'm not gonna speak specifically to any of these projects. So if you do have a question about a project that you see here, please put it in the, the Q&A. Uh, this is, and, and most of them are all labeled, so you should, should know what they are. This is face, Facebook's headquarters, a seminal project that we did in 2009, it really kind of launched us, launched, launched our career after studying workplace for already a quite a long time. And I like to start these talks with you all, um, just a little bit of how I got into the business because it was quite a convoluted path. I'm not a trained interior designer. I actually in high school, uh, there wasn't a lot of art classes, no design classes, but I managed to take a class that might've been a summer class where I was asked to draw something with dots. And I chose a puppy being a teenager, an awful puppy portrait. But um, I was so like shocked and how incredible this puppy portrait came out that I, that I did in dots, uh, basically, uh, um, what is it called? Pointillism, right? The impressionist style that I just, I knew I found my talent. I knew I'd find, found my, my passion. And I never looked back. I, I knew I wanted to get into the creative world, the creative industry in one way or another. I went off for the summer. I went to Europe and went to every Impressionist museum that I could, could, get, could get into. And then that fall, I started at San Jose State in the, in the fine arts program and then went to graduate school actually in landscape architecture because I was really interested in the environment. I really believe that oh, I should all advance these slides while I talk really believe that that the environment um, is helps us 
connect with our human potential and, and a quality environment really does that. And, and, and I, and I translated that into workplace design. I had never, didn't even know, I never even heard of workplace design. Uh, about a year after I finished grad school, I had the opportunity to start a business. I had already always had an entrepreneurial spirit and jumped at the chance to start an interior design firm in the Silicon Valley. And that is a uh, very key to our entire career because we were in the Silicon Valley. Our very first clients were tech clients like Facebook, AOL, um, Motorola, those types of companies. Um, and they really understood that the environment, like I was just, what I was just saying is plays a role in creativity and innovation. And it's so competitive in the Silicon Valley that in order to have a leg up, you have to have a pulse on that creativity and that innovation. So we were in the early days, we were creating brainstorm rooms and collaboration rooms and huddle rooms and all of these really creative spaces and starting to understand, I think with Facebook, like I was saying, it was a very seminal project, starting to understand Facebook, we, our concept was, was this idea of neighborhoods and we started to understand that a workplace, a good, a well-designed workplace is a, a compilation of different types of spaces that create an ecosystem that people can be in, that, that can cater to the introvert, the extrovert, people that need super quiet space, people that want connection and collaboration, people that just want it really, that maybe even just want it loud. And so, um, we, we honed that. Uh, I just uh, just loved the fact that I've landed in workplace. It's to me, uh, we spend more of our waking hours in our, well, we did before the pandemic. We don't so much now uh, at our office and not at our homes in our office. And so and for a person who really believes the environment impacts uh, our human potential, I, was, I realized quickly that to create a well-designed, space that really inspires um, is it can do so much for so many individuals that come to work all the employees that come to work so that's been my focus and my passion for a number of years and i'm going to transition into uh, i i i started to get an an urge to get back into my creative side after doing so many of these projects with clients. This is Slack's headquarters, one of our more recent projects in San Francisco. And just you can see all the different varieties of spaces here. Oh, let me check my time. They had a great concept. We uh, had this idea of this um, walk, a walk along the Pacific Crest Trail. So it, this, this, and, and the space starts, we have the, all the floors in a skyscraper. So we started out in the ground floor, kind of in the desert and kind of ascending to the, to the, that, that's this, this space here is the, the top, the peak. And um, this is Uber. We did a couple of, couple of offices for Uber really playing around with integrating technology and then also these kind of merging kind of this more hospitality like finishes with a, a very tech backdrop. And so I was talking about this ecosystem. This is what we distilled it down to these different types of spaces. And I'm showing this because I and, and kind of take a mental snapshot of this because I'm going to show you some new typologies that we've developed since the pandemic that we've kind of added to this, to this menu. And this menu isn't meant to be static. It's not just 10. This, you could combine, say, studio and workshop, right, and create something a little different or something a little new. And of course, you don't need them all, depending on what your program is and who your client is. But, but we've really kind of lived by this, um, this idea that, that, is, that a quality workspace has to have a, the right amount of ingredients to, to work for, for as an office. All right, so I was saying that, oh, let's see, probably around 2000, 
12, I started to think, okay, it's, these projects are great. I mean, tech companies have, they typically have money, usually short budgets, I mean, short timeframes, which isn't great, but a lot of, they give us a lot of freedom to experiment and do some really great designs. But I was starting to feel like I wanted to see what else design could do, especially coming from an art background. I was still on the side doing a little bit of art. And so I started a whenever I had the opportunity, doing some projects that were more in between art and design and, and more true experiments, but always thinking about workplace. This was my one of my first opportunities in 2016 to, I had a pop-up space that I was allowed to use for a month. And I wanted to experiment with how somebody might personalize their own space given a very small number of parts and pieces, building blocks. And so the, the building blocks here you can see is a, a box. Oops, sorry about that, but that's okay. A box, a little cozy that connects the boxes and a rubber band that connects the boxes, a couple of work surfaces. And of course we had to put in a few chairs. And so over a course of a month, we allowed people to use the space um, for free, as long as they were willing to create their own environment. And then we, we documented this. And this was a, an urban planner. We had urban planners. We had, this, um, let's see, we had an architect. We had a clay studio. We had a taxidermist. A uh, really interesting group of people. There's a lot of makers in Charleston and they had a lot of fun with this space. And I have a little video to go with this. Okay. <clears throat> a couple of years later, I had another opportunity to, to play around with an experimental experimental project and try out some ideas in a, in a much more creative way, basically without a client. And it was at Salone de Mobili in Milan, the Milan Furniture Fair, the big one in, usually it's in the spring. And we were asked to be one of to represent one of the four quadrants northwest southeast we were asked to represent the west so they asked for architects and designers and i really took that to heart i started to think about the west and the west the front the western frontier california being being that ultimate frontier but i was also thinking about resilience in the face of environmental collapse and this is the first time i really started to think about climate change and some of the things that some of the forces that were starting to happen that were becoming really visible i should say um, on, to to society obviously climate change has been happening for a while but um so my so i started with this dystopian assumption that basically that there would be a huge scarcity of water in the future we were looking at the future of work and i'm thinking to myself you know in the future, we're going to be coming together. Oh, let me keep, I, I'm going to forget to advance these slides, but I'll, I'll get to them eventually. We're going to come together first to survive, to to court, to coordinate, um, to mobilize um, in the face of needing to adapt to a warming planet. And so, 
So the title is The Water Cooler, and it's also this idea of coming together as a community. But I was also exploring a number of, of other themes, in, including how mobile could we be? How, it, like if you could actually pack your desk on your back or your chair uh, as a backpack or put your a tablet um, as a vest and walk and write or, oops, excuse me, this is a little touchy. Um, or this this uh, sleeping bag piece, maybe you could work lying down with the types of technologies that we might have in the future. So we explored mobility, we called these uh, work prosthetics. And then this was uh, our iteration of the water cooler. It was an, a piece by an artist that was the central point. And again, this idea of coming together um, over limited resources and uh, just really enjoyed that project. And then again, a couple of years later, this time the, I wasn't seeing an opportunity. So I created one for ourselves, for our firm. Uh, we, we bought a food truck and we wanted to see what, how, how design could be a force for good. How could we go out into the community and work with people that we don't typically get a chance to work with, people that might need our design services, but wouldn't even know where to find us. And so we decided we needed to go to them. So we purchased this truck. It was an ice cream truck that we converted to a mobile design lab. And we went out on a couple of stops. I probably won't get into too many, too much specifics on each of these stops, but here we're helping some pop-up retailers, some up and coming pop-up retailers with some point of purchase um, displays and things like that. And um, in Fremont, we actually, I love this shot because here the food truck is with, it's kind of in its element with the other food trucks. But here, the community, we, we each time we came here, we had a community meeting, uh, brainstormed what they wanted, what their highest needs were. And in this case, they wanted to add a mini golf hole to their mini golf course. So we built a hole for their course. And here's people using it. In Bakersfield, you see all these maps. We did more of an envisioning project around a blighted neighborhood in the downtown and, and what how the residents in that immediate neighborhood might want to see that revitalized. Really enjoyed this project. Uh, people were just wonderful, but he was super curious, wanted to know what we were doing. And <clears throat> with each of these projects, we, we wanted to be designers and create a space or do something that was spatial. And so for Bakersfield, we actually spray painted the the um, uh, parking lot out in front of this cafe and created kind of a space that way and then built some of this, this lawn furniture that we hoped were, was going to take off and start to more that more people we left the blueprints for these pieces and our hope was that the residents would build their build these site site furnishing furnishings and identify the neighborhood that way We'll need to go back and see if that actually happened. Finally, we did a trip in Los Angeles. With each of these, we partnered with an, a nonprofit or a local community organization. And in this case, we partnered with a group called River LA. And we created these signs to basically bring awareness to the LA River, that, that plain and simple, that's what we did. And then we went around Los Angeles and put up these signs. And at the end, we had a big community party. And I just, I, I, I just, um, I want to do more of this type of work. It, it was really exciting, really rewarding. And I'm going to just, if I can't find an opportunity, I'm going to have to make another one for myself and for my firm. I, last time I did a talk, I put it out there that if you want to find me on LinkedIn and send me your address, I will send you a book and a couple students last time from the University of Oh, I can't remember. Kansas did, did that just that. So please um, connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to book. Okay, now I'm going to shift to future of work. Um, I think uh, obviously everybody um, had to put on the brakes in a big way. Ugh, about just about exactly two years ago, uh, middle of March, two years ago, 
we all had to go home and not go back to work. We didn't know very little warning. And we, it was just, it's been, as you know, lockdown. And it was fascinating to me watching this that we, we've talked about, postulated about work from home and how that might work with, with a company's directives and, and integrate, how could people integrate, but all of a sudden we just had to do it. And this is my question is like, what if it works? And it has not, ex not exclusively, not well for anyone, better for others. It's always a case by case scenario. And it depends on whether you ask the employees or whether you ask the employers. I think one of the biggest challenges is culture, right? And maintaining culture from remote. But I do think that working from home, there's a lot of possibility here. And whether we like it or not, it's going to change my what I do, workplace design. It's going to change how we design offices going forward. Absolutely. And for example, this uh, CEO says, we don't need offices anymore. And what if that was true, right? What would we use all this space for? And another really exciting idea, um, okay, you might work from home, but you might go down to your local coffee shop, or maybe there's a co-working space in your, in your downtown, right? I know that a lot of our employees work in Oakland and some of and but our offices in San Francisco. What if we all started to um, share space in these other downtowns with other firms and open up satellite offices and um, have so this is this idea of distributed work really fascinates me in part because of this directive. I read about this during the pandemic. I did a lot of reading during the pandemic. The mayor of Paris, this was February 2020, right, right, right when the pandemic had started, had designated that um, she wanted Paris to be a walkable city. And in order to do that, she, she, she called it the 15 minute city. And the idea was that all of your services, anything that you would need would be within a 15 minute bike or walk zone, or at least fairly close to and that you could just do that throughout the city and that you wouldn't need cars and you wouldn't need a lot of other types of infrastructure. So anyways, I just wanna show you a couple of pictures of some more recent projects where we're starting to play around with some new ideas for how to design workspaces that are more flexible, more open-ended, um, more where the, the employee or the person inhabiting the space creates a program and kind of going back to that idea of the pretend store that I did in Charleston, South Carolina. And here's another uh, project that has this flexible, movable conference room. And here's a project for uh, Microsoft. We did a larger project for Microsoft. This was just an innovation lab for them, a small space for them where they really want to show off their technology. And so this, this is this idea of how people might have a meeting. Well, not so much in the future, but now. And so some people are present physically and some people are present virtually. So a hybrid, here's an example of a, a hybrid meeting. And I, I said I would share this. These are some new typologies that we're playing around with what we're thinking might be something that will would work in when when I say future office, I mean today, I mean tomorrow. We're we're designing we're designing these types of spaces now for the new workplace because workplaces are already they're already going to be different. People are already taking out desks, making more space for communities, communal spaces, more spaces to to meet and and mingle and 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 build communities. So it's been really interesting. Okay, now, let's see, time check. Oh yeah, okay. Future of design. So about, just actually, it was a little before the pandemic, 2019, it was the third year of wildfires. And, you know, I'd always known, my, my dad's a scientist. I, we've always recycled, we've always talked about, um, uh, emissions and global warming. 
and um, you know, using public transportation, you know, I, I kind of grew up being that kind of person, but I always, I always put climate change to the back of my mind. And, but in tw summer of 2019, I realized that it, it, I couldn't do that anymore. And I couldn't, and I had to look at it, not just personally, but professionally. And so I started to think about what does, what does addressing climate change and some of these, all of these other pressing issues that are related to climate change, how does that impact our practice and how we do design? And it, so it was basically a, a journey of discovery, educating myself on what, what we were doing and right and wrong and most pretty much we were mostly doing everything wrong. And so many things have to change in our practice and we're working on that now. And so the next few minutes, I'm just gonna show you and share with you how we're trying to retool our practice. And I love this quote, I love this idea that we really, we have to be willing to design with uncertainty and with these invisible forces in mind. We have to be comfortable being uncomfortable right now because the world is, so um, you can't pin it down anymore. You, you absolutely can't. And this comes from this article called Designing to Survive. And um, you know, I, I hope it's, I feel like that, that, that does play into everything we design that we have to be thinking about. How is this design helping us to survive now and into the future? And so, so I called 2020, the year of the pandemic, I called it the, our year of action, but I ended up kind of going in a hole and, and uh, planting a garden that spring of the pandemic. And then finally by summer, I was like, okay, I gotta do something. And I decided to start a podcast and I started that. And then by fall, one of my designers said, you know, we really need to take some action <laughs> since you said you were gonna do that in 2020. And, Let's let's create a volume three. We had volume one and volume two address the pandemic and how to come back back to work safely and also explore some of those typologies. And volume three is specifically looking at the environmental crisis and um, how we can design more sustainably as a practice. And so we, I, I had a about a well, it, it varied, but anywhere between a two and a five person team. And we spent hours and hours researching and putting together what we we're, we're calling our eco playbook. And um, there's a number of chapters. There's a materials chapter, obviously as interior designers, specifying materials that have a low carbon impact, that aren't toxic, and that are socially responsible are very important. And honestly, even after doing all this research and trying to find ways to categorize materials and this and that, it is not easy and it's just incredibly confusing. And sometimes there's no good substitute for something that you absolutely have to specify. And it, it's incredibly frustrating, but it's something that we are starting to integrate into our practice in a big way. We have a chapter on biophilic design, on nature, um, in part because you, uh, I, my understanding is that if you are, if you don't have any connection to nature, you're not going to care. You really need to have some connection to nature, and that 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 will um, inform your decision, your decision making. And on top of that, there's been a lot of a lot of evidence that designing with biophilic principles. I'm sure you've been doing this in some of your classes. Has huge benefits for uh, mental and physical well being. And we have a chapter, this, we actually, now what we're doing in my office is every other week we have a workbench and we're rolling out parts of, parts of chapters and going through them in, in, in detail. And right now we're going through this chapter, which is the minimal waste chapter. And we're looking at how to reuse, how to, how to reduce our industry, in our industry as well in our specific discipline of workplace, you know, these are leases. So we're designing spaces that have lease, short-term leases of maybe sometimes three years. Facebook was a three-year lease. We knew that was going to be a super short, short project. So we kind of planned for that a little bit in advance, but three years or five years or maybe even 10 years, but most of the materials 
that are created for these, like the carpet, the chairs, the desks, they could last, I forgot like the chair I'm in, this Herman Miller chair could last uh, hundreds of years probably if it was, if it was taken, well taken care of. But most of the time, we don't plan for any of this stuff to get reutilized or salvaged or even recycled. It just goes to landfill and that absolutely needs to change. And so we're looking at all of that in a big way, just even designing in advance, knowing that something isn't going to need to be there for very long, how you take it apart, how you can just dis disassemble it. Design for disassembly is a big, something that we're looking at in a big way. And then finally, we can't not look at social equity. That's absolutely a part of the climate conversation. And so we have a chapter on di um, equity and, and uh, looking at inclusive design and equitable design and how it really is about designing for everyone. All right, let's see, I have, okay, 235. Um, I did have, I wanted to share just this slide really quick if you haven't all seen this. And uh, just the interior design industry, the construction industry, the architecture industry, you know, we, we do, there's, we do create a lot of waste and there's, we, we have this um, building operations, which is, also carbon emissions, but there's embodied carbon, which is another big factor that we've been tackling and exploring and starting to understand is a, is a huge part. So really, and thinking about um, the fact that we're, we're quickly realizing we have limited resources on this planet. So we have to figure out ways to recycle and reuse these materials and not send them to landfill. There's, so there's so many reasons to, to start to incorporate all of this into our practices. And <laughs> um, hopefully I uh, didn't make that sound like a, like a, just like bashing your head, but um, I, it's, it's, it's basically what I have transitioned my entire career to now is exploring how to how to reimagine our design practice. And so um, I welcome any questions around that or the work that I showed or the experimental projects that I showed. So you kind of already answered this, but the whole theme of our lecture series here is this idea of post pandemic futures and obviously we're not post yet, but what do you think is the greatest opportunity for the design field kind of as we've had these multiple years to reassess and retool? The greatest opportunity for the design field? Yes. <laughs> I don't want to go too far to my, uh, I feel like I'm starting to get into this like um, almost like a, like a dogma, right? Um, I really think that designers are going to be at the center of, of the solutions that need to happen because we ask questions, we're problem solvers, right? And we ask the right questions. We're, we're trained to ask questions and we're, try, and we're trained to figure out what the right question is to ask. And then, and then we're trained to, to solve the problem. And one of our, like, for example, one big problem is that we're a linear economy. That's exactly what I was talking about with our res our limited resources. We, we take it, we, we use it, and then we throw it away. And we really need to start, well, we are starting, but we really need to, in a big way, embrace a circular economy. And designers are at the heart and center of that. And I think that that's, that's probably the biggest impact that we can have is to help design new systems. And they're not necessarily... Um, spaces or objects or pro products, but they're actual systems, societal systems. And um, designers can have a huge role to play in that. And I, and I think it starts with not limiting yourself and, think, and thinking, oh, I, I design spaces, so I can't, I can't think about this or I can't do that. It's really about um, expanding your idea of what a designer is. I would love to also hearing kind of your personal background and your, your professional and academic background and how all of those have kind of come full circle in what you're currently investigating. So I think that's great. So we have a question from um, Sarah, who is with 
uh, at the University of Nebraska Kearney, so one of our other campuses, and she says, have you designed a space that is fully sustainable or as much as it can be? Sustainable design can sometimes seem overwhelming. How did you go about planning for that project? Yeah, not, no, not fully sustainable yet. We, I would be the first to admit that we're behind a number of other design firms and architecture firms that are truly exploring, uh, I wouldn't even call it sustainable. I actually think in this day and age, sustainable is almost a word that we're, we're past sustainable because we've, we've really, we've gone so far to the other end that at this point in time, we actually have to be regenerative. We actually have to give back more than we take. And um, so sustainable isn't enough, but it is something. And, so, and usually if you're designing something sustainable, you're solving for a lot of things that other things as well. It's kind of like this multi-pronged approach and, and take, taking one approach will often solve for others. But we recently completed Adidas, an Adidas project in Oregon, and it was just an architect magazine. And the because of the client, I would love to have said it was our our charter, but it was the client wanted to reuse as much as possible. And so we based we had to scavenge all their other sites, their um, retail sites, and their other office sites. And it wasn't just furniture, it was fixtures, it was light fixtures, it was in some cases construction material. And at first it was an exercise that my designers were like, no, no, make us do this. Oh my God, what a nightmare. But once it was almost like writing, and for us, for myself being in the industry a long time, we used to do this all the time. We didn't, we didn't buy furniture for a client unless we absolutely had to. We would scrounge and put pieces together and stuff like that. But but the last 15 years or so, 15 or 20 years ago or so. Since then, you know, everything seems to be new. So my my designers were like, I don't know how to do this. But once we got our sea legs on and we got into the rhythm of it, it wasn't that hard. And it ended up being just a great creative exercise. We got super creative with, with how we use things. And, um, and, and, and at the end of the day, saved the client time, money. And it was actually quite an impre incredible uh, exercise. And we want to do it again. They, they're like, okay, let's just, let's do it again. So <laughs> Nice. I think that's another really good point too. There's a lot of terminology around, um, you know, sustainable design, regenerative design, resilient design, and you did mention resiliency um, in your lecture. Can you kind of define what like resiliency or resilient design versus regenerative design means? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I and I I like to take it back to this idea of how you deal with climate change. Um, so there's this idea of mitigation, which is basically trying to solve for climate change, trying to pull carbon out of the air, trying to get cars off the road, lower, our, lower emissions, lower our carbon footprint. And then there's adaptation, it's understanding that we're already experiencing climate change, we're already experiencing weather extremes and vol volatility and things like that, and sea level rise. And so adaptation and resilience are related there. So you're, you're building to be resilient to, or adapt. I, I always like adapt adaptation better because resilience to me feels like you're still trying to, um, to fight it off versus ad adapt. You're actually understanding that it's happening to you and that you, you have to change too. But but they're related. So the idea of resilience is that you're that you're um, you're creating something that's stronger than or bet, um, that can withstand versus um, you. I just, I was comparing that to sustainable or regenerative. Oh, regenerative. Oh yeah yeah. Okay, so that's resilient. And then regenerative is something that is truly integrated that then that gives back that um puts puts um well it could put co2 back into the air it could um, um 
It could even regenerate a community. It could be a community building that, that um, maybe it's a community that's experienced a lot of, um, a lot of people leaving and maybe it's bringing people back to a community. So um, there's a lot of ways to regenerate, but regenerate, regeneration is bringing life back. We have another question and it says, being trained in art and landscape architecture, but practicing as an interior designer, what would you say that each discipline has in common and what makes them perhaps distinct from one another? Or would you say that the disciplines in fact are not so different than one another? So interior designer and what was the other one? So they're interested in your background in art and landscape, oh. but obviously now practicing in the field of interior design. And so kind of wondering what um, each of the disciplines may have in common or difference, or if they actually are that different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say art and any kind of design, the difference between art and design is that artists tend to ask questions and don't necessarily solve versus uh, designers are problem solvers. And, and they, and, Sometimes I think designers may not ask, they might not ask a question that they know they can't solve for, whereas an artist would, right? Mm -hmm. So ask questions, solve problems. Um, landscape architecture and interiors, there was so much in common. And in the early days, I loved space planning. I loved doing test fits. Um, you know, anything in a, in a plan view, I absolutely loved working with. Um, and, and then landscape is a lot about layering of materials and so is design, just different materials. And so there was a lot of similarities. Uh, there's another question from a student that says, uh, does your firm seek to create multidisciplinary teams to work on projects or would you look for designers that are cross-trained in different fields? Uh, whoever asked that, I would love for them to explain the difference. I feel like they, in some ways it's the, the means is the end. Wait, how would I say that? The ends and the means are the same. <laughs> um, um, it's hard to find designers that are cross-trained, I have to admit, but we do love, we do love finding anybody with a unique background or with even a, a unique skill on top of their design skills. Um, we always use multidisciplinary disciplinary teams. We have a product, people that are know a lot about product. We, know, we have people that know a lot about design build. And when I say design build, I mean small scale design build. And we work with a lot of graphic designers. We have a number of graphic designers on our staff. Um, let's see, did somebody write something more about this? No, that's a, the next Another question. question. <laughs> I know, I, I should just see if we get I'm going to turn this Q&A okay. off. I try, I'm trying to read it. You're doing a much better <laughs> job of asking me these questions. I'm getting distracted. Um, so we love multi, we love having a multidisciplinary team whenever possible. I think it, it brings so much more richness to a project. Absolutely, hands down. And then the other thing that we found is nearly everyone on our staff has some side gig, I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't know if it's a gig exact, exactly, but a hobby or a passion. And we do everything we can to bring that into our practice or celebrate it. We actually just, some somebody in our office just shared, he does these beautiful uh, pencil drawings and he shared a number of pencil drawings. Somebody left our practice and wrote a cookbook. <laughs> and during, while she was there, we actually incorporated, we had her bake a cake for a project and incorporated the design of the cake and we did this kind of convoluted thing with her. So uh, it's always refreshing and it makes things so much more creative when you're able to look at things from different angles. Uh, so the next question is from one of our colleagues, another interior design professor, Nate Bisek. He said, can you talk a little bit about how your approach to materials informs your process? I noticed some use of digital fabrication, like in the Microsoft virtual space, some examples of low tech, the Charleston pop-up space, Bakersfield, et cetera, and those decisions driven by desired material use, exploring process, some combinations. And then he said, thank you again for sharing your work. I would say our approach, sometimes it drives me crazy because it, it can take, it can really 
take a lot of time, but our approach to materials is to, to be super experimental with them, to really see what, what limits, how far we can take them, um, how we could maybe use a material that in, in a way that it's not meant to be used. I'm thinking about this project that we did a while back for Microsoft where we, you know, loading docks that have the flaps, the plastic flaps, we actually use those flaps as a conference room wall material. <laughs> so I think the more, again, the more you can think outside the box with materials, the more creative you can get on projects. And for O plus A, we live and die by how creative we can get on projects. Now I want us to live and die by how creative we can get with projects within a sustainable or regenerative model. <laughs> Um, well, I have a question. I've always been a really big fan of the food for thought truck. And I was ask you questions any chance I get about this on designers having and dwellings having donuts. I brought that up as well. But oh, yeah, I'm really interested in ways that either you personally or your firm as a whole are finding unique ways to engage with community. I know obviously COVID has kind of changed that, but where do you see that going or what's kind of the next step for O plus A in that field? Oh, we donated our truck to mobile ma Chicago Mobile Makers. I was sad to do it, but it, it took a lot of effort to have a design team out on the road and we just couldn't, couldn't afford to do it. Uh, they're an incredible group bringing after school programming, shredding and, and architectural ideation to, to high school students. And the food truck is now on its way to Boston, I found out, <laughs> which is very cool. I'm gonna have to go visit it. But uh, no, it opened the, it opened a door for me that I, I'm super excited about exploring more, exploring more. But I probably see it happening with pro bono projects and the right pro and the right pro bono projects. We did a, a project with a local organization. We're in South of Market in San Francisco, it's called SOMA. And there's a group called SOMA Filipinas. They're a Filipino cultural group, local community group, and we help them design some retail space. And then right now I'm working with an interesting organization called Urban, Urban Alchemy. And they hire ex-convicts to work the streets to be kind of like ambassadors on the streets of San Francisco. And there's quite a few streets, especially in my neighborhood, South of Market, that are, are pretty gritty have, and, and getting grittier, sadly, there's you know so many homeless and street issues, but I, I'm actually working with them right now and we're creating some murals in their office and helping them make create an exciting office space, which they wouldn't be able to do if they did, couldn't get a design firm to help them. So it's mostly pro bono projects, but I would love to take on a, like a, like a, a, a standalone project would be yeah again it's one of these days i'll find a way so i'll put it out there as kind of last round of question inserts if anyone else has them and while people are thinking i have one more that i will ask on behalf of the students so they have the career fair coming up next week and i know a lot of them have a lot of nerves or anxieties about it what um, piece of advice would you either give them or what would you say when you all are interviewing students really stands out um, either in a portfolio or kind of in that interview process as well? Oh, geez, that's, a, that's a, okay. What stands out? Um, I think, well, I have so much advice I could give, but I would say know that it you may only get one like a split second chance to make an impression. So think of something that 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 is like super dynamic or super that 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 um, that the person you're showing your portfolio to or talking to can really um, grab that grabs their attention. I'd say that's that's probably number one. And then I always look for somebody's passion, and if that comes through. That's huge. And, but be careful. Don't be so passionate about like your, I don't know, your hand sketches that you go, <laughs> you start going down that hole. And then 10 minutes later, you've lost your audience. But I think if you, if your passion come through, 
and your passion shows up in a in a professional way in your portfolio or in what you've written or share or what you're sharing that's that's huge I could keep asking you more and more questions. <laughs> Darn, I could have I could have talked longer about the food truck, but I was trying to rush through for the Q and A's. <laughs> I'll ask one more question again. I'll give everyone else another chance to put right. up in the Q and A. Um, so I again, I, I really loved following Opasay's approach to kind of your own self study and your way of educating yourself and then further educating the design community. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that culture then translates into your day-to-day -day office environment or just even your design teams as well? Mm -hmm. So, so our, the, our, basically you're asking about the culture of our firm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's been a bit of, of an interesting roller coaster lately. I'll have to admit um, we have not, uh, our firm has not been immune to the to the transitioning that that people have been making. We, like I mentioned, that one that was, this was actually before the pandemic. She left to write her cookbook. It was it was her dream, and as much as she loved design, she wanted to write a cookbook. But um, I think our culture is very much about design and art and bringing those together and celebrating celebrating that. And um, it's, our, our culture is also, um, we're 30 people, so we know each other and everybody, it, it's been really hard not being in the same office um, in terms of, especially I think for, for everybody that's, they're all friends and it's, it's been just super challenging, but um, our culture is, and I, and I think this comes from my art background and maybe the, going back to that question about how is art and design different? I think one of the things that art can do is you can have a very um, out there concept, like a very experimental, a very, um, <clears throat> uh, what would be a good word for that? Um, Not, I don't want to say esoteric, but, but you can have a concept that, that's really exploring some kind of radical ideas. Whereas a design practice, your design concept for a, a company is, has got to be grounded, grounded in what the company is about and all these other factors. But I have always pushed my, com my company to, to really push the idea of concept. And so we start, I think, at a very different place than a lot of other firms do. We spend a lot of time on initial concept before we get into design. And so I think that's a big part of our practice. Now we're getting some more questions. So uh, oh. this one's very relevant. It says, tell us about the art behind you. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> I can actually flip up. So I these are um, weavings that I did in Marfa, Texas with a fantastic uh, weaver and fabric designer named Suzanne Tick. I was there for a, a week with her. And these are some collages I did recently, just scooping around. <laughs> and I just moved to a new house and I actually pretty excited about this little thing I just did. Um, I, I'm, I'm creating a little book and it's called Domestic Bliss. And then it's going to say, instead of bliss, it's going to say blister. And, and I'm thinking of this idea of your space. The idea of a, a, a blister is created from friction, from rubbing on something or something being a little bit uncomfortable. And I, I have this theory about discomfort and challenge. That, that's how you grow. That's how you, you know, like get out of your rut or become a, a just, um, build develop yourself, I suppose. And so this idea of domestic blister is like domestic, it's not domestic bliss, it's domestic blister. And so my, I'm, I'm gonna do this two-sided book with like a very traditional, and I'm, and I'm gonna abstract it on every page until I get to the center. 
And then the other side, I'm starting with Andrea Zattel, who's the artist who has the A to Z living house in Joshua Tree. And I'm going to abstract this way. And some these two these two uh, examples or or um, uh, types are going to meet in the middle somehow. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> so I I try to make time for my art when I can, but a lot of times it's it's small things. Like these weavings are just done on a hand loom and I can do one in, mm. I could do one in an hour. So I have to, yeah, I try to, and, and this little booklet I can play around with whenever I have time. So I, at this point in time, I've, I've my art practice is, has, has shrunk. <laughs> at, at least I still have a, a small practice. Yes, absolutely. All right, so we'll finish out these last three questions. This one might be a quick answer. It says, do you do any work rehabilitating historic buildings or kind of historic interior renovations? No, we don't. I'm trying to think if we ever had any. No, we don't. We don't at all. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any advice for student organizations as far as creative service projects we can do for the community? Oh, like IIDA, ASID student orgs. Oh, that's a great question. And I don't, off the top of my head, student organizations, like, like, a, like, a, like a University of Nebraska Design Association. Yeah, we have a, a joint um, IIDA, ASID student org, NOMA, AIAS, those types of student orgs that I think have been, again, coming out of COVID, trying to figure out more ways to get people engaged in activities and community outreach as well. Have they reached out to the IDA chapter, the bigger chapter there, that they might have some ideas. Um, I, I've been recently thinking a lot about design and um, messaging and storytelling. And I wonder if teaming up or finding organizations that are trying to do some storytelling like amplifier art or um, the wide awakes, like maybe finding an organization and volunteering for an organization or um, or even just, um, it would depend on what, what you would wanna do in a community. And with the food truck, our best success was when we partnered with the right community organization or nonprofit organization. So I would say find a nonprofit or a community organization that wants, wants your help or wants, and, and try to find how you can make the connection between design and whatever it is that you're doing. Cause I mean, we could go volunteer at a, a, at a kitchen or something and prep mm -hmm. food for people or whatever, but we want to be designing stuff, right? So creating things, making things. All right, and then our last question that we'll close it out for the evening with is, in your firm and as a designer, how important is prototyping or getting outside of the digital realm to test and see ideas in the process? Does this happen naturally or do you have to be proactive in forcing yourself to output? Yeah, prototype, it's, it all depends. <clears throat> I would say five years ago, I might've answered this question much more differently. I would have said, absolutely, everything needs to be prototyped. But I think, I don't know, we're all turning into, we're all turning into robots. We're getting much better at prototyping in our, in our heads and in our computers to the point where I think that in, at, on some projects, prototyping is not, not all that important. And it, literally five years ago, I, can't, I would never, I can't believe it. I would have never thought that I would have said that. I, I love model making. I grew up building models and, um, and, and making models and doing studies, full scale, half scale, whatever. And um, yeah, I couldn't imagine a time when we wouldn't be doing that. But yeah, it all depends. It all depends on what you're working on and how familiar you are with the material and all that type of stuff. I think it'll be interesting to see too as people transition out of their home offices back into maybe more of a um, collective office space if that does change as well too. Yeah, true. Yeah. Well, 
Verda, again, I want to thank you very, very much for spending, I guess this is your afternoon, but our early evening with us here in Nebraska and um, sharing your story and about the work of Studio O Plus A. And we're very honored to have you spend this time with us. So thank you again very much.